told Josh it's been so long since I've been up here. I'm not sure if I'm uh, going to remember what's right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for wearing your masks and um, being okay with us having a different form of worship. It, uh, it's odd, but at least we're together. Um, we do have uh, the offering plate is going to be left back here, so feel free to drop your offering in there. Am I okay? Can you understand me? Yeah. Okay. I feel that she says no. Oh, thank you. I just All thought right. that if, I, if you were uncomfortable, I should be too. No, that's the mic inside. Well, I did, but it still sounded muffled in my own head anyway. I didn't know if it was muffled to your ears. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Now I feel bad, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are, after this, this uh, service, we are going to have a short congregational meeting to um, vote in uh, Mike and April. They've agreed to join the um, uh, session to help lead our church. So we're very happy about that and grateful. Um, uh, we are going to continue to meet together in person as long as we are able. So um, I, we're still recording uh, and putting it on live for those who can't come and I'm still mailing out the sermons and everything to our um, people who are can't get out or shut in. I think that's all. Are there any other announcements that I'm forgetting? Okay, good. Um, all right. We'll start with our call to confession. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are tired, who are worn out from carrying heavy burdens. Put down the heavy load that you are carrying, and you will find rest for your souls. And we are doing the prayer of confession out loud, just like we're not singing out loud. Feel free to sing in your head and hum along, but we want to kind of keep the spray down as much as possible. Our prayer of confession. God, we confess that we do not always understand our own actions. We clearly know what is right, what you expect of us, but we do not always do it. We also clearly know what is wrong, the thoughts and actions that hurt others and offend you, but we do these things anyway. Forgive us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, set us free from the sin that controls us. People of God know this. Our God is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. When we stumble, he is there to catch us. When we are weighed down, God is there to lift us up. So be at peace, for your sins are forgiven. Amen. Um, I'm going to continue what I was doing with the online uh, services, which I was reading part of the psalm each time, but I forgot to tell Don, so it won't be up here. But I'm going to read um, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, and then 13 through 18. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. The Lord is faithful in all his words, and gracious in all his words. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, Lord, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Our, I forgot about our hymns. This is weird. <laughs> Sorry. I'm doing it along the way. So the first hymn we were going to do is... Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. I completely forgot. We haven't done hymns. What do you got? Let's just go straight to Amazing Grace. Okay. <laughs> We've already gathered together. We know we're right. here. Hold on. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. We'll get used to this again. This is a version of Amazing Grace by Chris Tomlin. Um, and it was not. We're not doing that one. Never mind. We're doing the original Amazing Grace. We'll get used to it. chapter 6, we're actually just going to read one verse out of it, uh, verse 16, and it's, it's God talking to the people. Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way lies, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And our gospel reading is from Matthew. And Jesus is talking to the people once again. We're going to start with verse 16 and read to 19 and then go over to verse 27. The people were complaining about John the Baptist not being what they thought he should be. And so this is what Jesus has to say. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, but and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated in her deeds. And then verse 27 might be familiar to many of you. It's one of my favorite um, verses, 27 through 30. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the sermon I'm going to share with you today um, is one that I wrote um, about five years ago for one of my classes with um, Neil Weatherhawk. Um, it's going to follow the vein of one I did a couple weeks ago to start with about a uh, hymn series, describing the hymns, explaining the old hymns and how they got it. We're going to start with What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And that's a really familiar hymn to most of us. Because the lyrics are beautiful and they're comforting, both clear and distinct. The author of the poem that became this hymn was no stranger to pain and hardship. Irish-born Joseph M. Scriven was 25 years old, in love, and engaged to be married. And while there are many origin stories of the hymn, the most common is that his fiancé died before their wedding to take place in a tragic drowning accident. Joseph was heartbroken, and he fled his homeland and decided to start a new life in Canada. And while he was there working as a teacher, he once again fell in love and became engaged. But once more, Joseph's hopes and dreams were shattered when his bride-to-be became ill and died before the wedding could take place. Although one can only imagine the turmoil within this young man, history tells us that he turned to God with his burdens and was sustained. Soon after his second fiancé's death, Joseph joined the Plymouth Brethren and began preaching in a Baptist church. Now he never did try and get married, but he spent the remainder of his life giving his time, money, and quite literally the clothes off his back to those in need. And he spread love and compassion of Jesus wherever he went. Now, around the same time, Joseph received word from Ireland that his mother was ill and he could not go be with her. So he wrote a letter of comfort and he enclosed one of his poems, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Now, Joseph had the two choices that we all have. In his grief and anger, he could have turned away from God and become bitter. Or he could turn to God and find peace and rest and comfort, and which we know from our story that that is what Joseph chose. He wrote the words, Are ye weak and heavy laden, encumbered with a load of bread? Scriven was also very open about his doubt, his bouts with depression. And we're not surprised given the death of his two fiancés and his mother within such a short time frame. But because he went on to pastor others, I think it's reasonable to assume that he got his inspiration and found comfort in Jesus' words about sharing his yoke. Come to me, all you that are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is light and easy. I don't know about you, but I don't exactly see a lot of oxen anymore working in fields. And I had to do a little bit of reading because we have machines now, and that's what gets used. But at one time, oxen were the go-to animal. A yoke ties two animals together, together, and they must work together, or the work won't get done. A properly fitting yoke will not, will not produce any discomfort or cause sores to form, but allows the animal to work at its full potential. Now, of course, the yoke does not take away from the work, but aids the animal in performing the task. A double yoke was placed on two oxen to share the burden of the work. The yoke of Jesus is not lighter because it is less work. But it is a double yoke because Jesus is sharing the work. 
Jesus invites us to cast off our heavy single yoke in exchange for his double yoke. I was reading other translations and I found the voice. It adds the words, when you are yoked to me. So verse 29 reads, when you are yoked to me, your weary souls will find rest. It adds an element that maybe is inferred, but through it is plainly stated. Walking beside Jesus, sharing him, sharing with him our burdens will give us a peace. The first burden in this passage that we read, Jesus, they're talking about the law on the Jewish people. Because over the years, the Jewish leaders had broken down those original Ten Commandments and added details. And perhaps they were trying to make it easier. But the leaders became hold over the rest of God's people. And these hypocrites tied up these heavy burdens, placed them on others, but then did nothing to help shoulder the load. Jesus is offering relief from these laws. And that relief is then extended to all believers. In Acts 15, there's an argument between Jewish believers and Gentile believers who are beginning to um, come to know God, come to know Jesus. And the Jewish believers feel like the Gentiles need to follow all the old laws first. And the question gets asked, if we Jewish people who have always had God failed continuously again and again, why on earth would we want to burden new believers with them? Like I said, the burden here was specific to the law, but we can't limit the application. Because at the same time, the first church of Jesus was also burdened with Roman taxes, farming, the burden of fear, the burden of being outcasts. For us today, these burdens have not changed much, except for the Roman tax part. So the saddened heart is included as well. There's a book called Ordinary Grace that was written by William Kruger, and it's a sort of coming of age story where the narrator of the book, Frank, remembers the summer death visited his family. The 13-year-old's growing mind gets burdened by, the, by this death, and the burden on his heart weighs on him as it does the entire family. In the book, Ordinary Grace, the family of five becomes laden with this horrific burden with the death of their oldest child, the daughter. And each family reacts differently to the death, reacts to God differently in their grief. The father draws nearer to God for comfort, while Ruth, the mother, retreats farther away. The two surviving children, both boys, are young, though they are on the cusp of adolescence. The younger brother has a terrible stutter, that pronounces itself when he is the center of attention, especially around strangers. The stutter has isolated the boy in many ways, and the death of his sister causes even more isolation. And so the first stages of his grief mirrors his mother's in terms of anger and bitterness. The middle son, Frank, our narrator, was beginning to question the existence of God before. But through the death of his sister, he began to find comfort in God's existence, following his father's example. Now, of course, there's no wrong or right way to grieve, but in Matthew, Jesus is offering his yoke to us to help us bear our grief, our frustrations, and our anger. Well, under his yoke, Jesus is not only comforting us, but teaching us as well. Jesus' yoke is a living example. 
when we are when we place our focus on God and on others, our own issues can seem not quite as big. We give our problems to God in prayer and then focus on our relationship with God and what our plan is for our life. Now the father in the book is a Methodist pastor and he grieves privately with God. But he still desires to focus on the congregations entrusted in him. Though the district superintendent in our treasurer uh, in our church offers to send someone to fill in the pulpits, but he declines. In the first sermon given days after the death of his daughter is an inspiring message of God's love surrounding the loss of the heartbroken with the promise of everlasting life. Matthew 11 says, Jesus' yoke is light, but we are also told elsewhere that Jesus' path is hard, the road less traveled than all that. He who learns must suffer, and even in our sleep, pain we cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until through our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. This is a quote from the Greek play, Aeschylus, and I had never read it until I saw it in Ordinary Grace. And my first reaction was negative. How can you say awful grace of God all my Christian life, I've heard how wonderful, how amazing God's grace is. The story of Joseph Scriver has different variations, but the common theme is the awful grace of God, reaching him through tragedy. And yet he chooses to see amazing grace. Lessons learned are very rarely learned without pain. That much is true. But with God's grace, we are wiser for them. And this is why, though Jesus' path is hard, his yoke is light. We find rest because Jesus shoulders that burden alongside us. And beside him, we find peace. Jesus is saying, come to me, learn from me. He never says, but only until I get bored. Jesus is there beside us for good. The mother, in ordinary grace, responded the exact opposite of her father, or her husband. She rejects God, though she is not portrayed as much of a believer in the first place. See, her role in the church was soloist and choir director. The narrator Frank at one point says he felt God's presence most reverently when his mother sang. Ariel, the daughter who was lost, was her accompanist. So music cemented the mother-daughter bond between the two. The death of her only daughter only seems to reinforce her belief that God isn't really there. How often have we been angry or confused or heartbroken when God's answers to prayer do not say what we want or resolve the problem? And the death of a loved one is no mere problem. It invades the depth of our souls. The author describes the mother at one point saying, grief like a weight Grief lay like a weight on every feature of her face, and she walked like someone too long in the desert without water. Though we may turn from God in anger or unbelief, as the grieving mother does, God never leaves us. As Jesus, he walks beside us until we are ready to turn with our burdens. Come to me, he says, again and again. In 
Jeremiah 6.16. God calls his people to follow the good road that he has already shown them, because there they will find peace. But the people refused. And it's easy to look back at all of those and think, why would they, why would they do that? But still today, we often ought to take the harder road, rather than asking Jesus to share our burdens. Buck up. We can handle it ourselves. This is not what God intends for God's people. God commands us to walk alongside the good ways because that is how we find rest. And yet we still refuse. Life is hard and our burdens, whether they be sin, financial problems, grief, or a host of other things, can weigh us down. But God offers us rest and peace of mind. When the heartsick mother refuses Jesus' yoke, she spirals deeper and deeper into her grief. She is angry with her husband for coping. She's angry with herself because she can't function to take care of herself, let alone her two surviving children. Yet in God's grace, she is still not left alone to shoulder the burden. God offers ordinary grace. See, the mother's heartache is so heavy that she leaves and she goes to stay with her father. The family is not reunited until they come together to say goodbye to their daughter and sister. During the funeral dinner, the mother snaps, losing her temper when her husband takes too long to bless the meal so we can eat already. In the heaviness of the awkward silence, the youngest son, Jake, the son who stutters in public when at the moment, has not played or acted like a child since learning of his sister's fate, stands up in front of everyone to say grace. It's a simple prayer, but it is said without a hint of a stutter. After Jake's prayer, his mother thanks him. And Frank says, I saw her whole face change. Now we really don't know whether she finds her way back to God or not, but this moment of ordinary grace starts her back on the, heal on the road to healing. Now, the book is called Ordinary Grace because this is only one of several examples where God's ordinary everyday grace given, gives breath to someone in small ways. The sermon after the father's sermon that he gives after his daughter is found is what touches Frank and begins his healing process. Now I read this book as part of a homework assignment. Um, and then I had to answer questions about it. <clears throat> and one of the questions asked for a moment of ordinary grace in my life. I read over the questions before I started the book. And when I first saw, read them, I thought, I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to write there. But after reading it, I knew exactly what the answer would be. I have said this before in other sermons, but I battle with mental illness. I have bipolar disorder, and there's a heavy emphasis on the depression. In 2011, Susan was two, and Stenna was a newborn, and I was having a hard time. It was a really bad day. I wasn't even able to get up and do what needed to be done. But outside, it was snowing these big, fat, beautiful flakes. And Susan was so excited. She insisted we call every single one of her grandparents to let them know it was snowing, and then go outside. So I helped her into her snow clothes, and I let her out, and I watched her from the window. As she walked in the snow, her face had the most beautiful look of wonderment and simple joy. It 
was that ordinary moment of seeing her at peace and in awe of something so simple that helped me realize in just how bad of a place I really was. And I was able to take the steps that I needed to start getting better again. That was God using ordinary grace to give me breath and sustain me. The yoke Jesus offers us is God's grace. We take it on, we heal, we rest, we find peace. And that grace comes in different forms. It is amazing, and it is awful, and it is ordinary. It is the amazing grace that saves us. It is the awful grace that wisens us. And it is the ordinary grace that sustains us, sustains us throughout all of life's hard times. beginning of our service, um, the offering plate is at the back, so we're doing that instead of passing it. And we're going to go ahead and play a short song to kind of help us get in that moment. services solely online is not being able to pray with everyone. I, of course, still pray for, every, for everyone on my own, but there really is something about being together in a group when you do your prayers. Um, I have written down already the family things that we passed away from the um, We want to be sure we keep them in our prayers. Uh, we want to say thank you and give a prayer of praise for Mike and April agreeing to join the session. It's uh, not always the most glamorous job or a fun job, <laughs> as everyone can attest if you've ever been on session. So we are very grateful for you choosing to serve our church in that way. Are there any other prayer requests that we want to lift up this morning? God, in times of weakness and hour of need, yours is the strength by which we carry on, the shoulder we rest our head upon. When our load is too heavy and too much to bear, yours are the arms stretched out to help us, the grace we need to depend on. Our hearts are heavy as we remember the loved ones of Nora Davison as they go through life now to find a new normal with her not with them anymore. We pray that you stretch your grace upon them, that you help them find rest and love and peace in your arms. In times of weakness, Lord, your voice is heard saying, come, find rest. This is grace divine. We are grateful that this grace is given to us freely and wholly, and we ask that you help us pass it on to others, that we may go out and show the same kind of grace to those we meet. Help us stay on the path, the path that leads to you, the path that is good and makes us wise and kind. We give you praise. 
We give you praise and thanksgiving for one another, for a chance to be together, even if it doesn't look like it usually does. We thank you for technology that allows us to still reach out to those who can't be here. We thank you for those who are willing to serve and make decisions and have discussions that aren't exciting but are necessary to the work of your church. We ask all these things and we give all this praise in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. If it's not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to offer you the benediction and then we'll play our last song, Near to the Heart of God, while we get ready to go into our congregational meeting. So go now to work for God's purposes. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Be filled with the same love and look to the interests of others. With reverence for God, May God quench your thirst with love and consolation. May Christ Jesus strengthen you and encourage you. And may the Holy Spirit lead you on and make your joy complete. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.